Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another day that thou hast given us all thy manifold blessings to us, all of which being totally undeserved, given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We thank thee that thou hast saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to thine own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We thank thee that thou hast given us thy spirit, who has been given us to guide us into all truth, which is to say uh, that we might have a full-orbed understanding, a comprehensive, though not perfect, understanding of the gospel, through which understanding we're enabled to live lives pleasing unto you, and we are enabled to die more and more into sin and live more and more unto righteousness. So enlighten us, cause us to understand and believe. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're still looking at um, Galatians 4 and 16, 17, 18, especially today, verse 18, uh, which is, Am I therefore... Become your enemy because I tell you the truth. They, which is to say the Judaizers, zealously affect you but not will. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Uh, I thought we might spend just a little time talking about the sermon last week who remembers the title of the sermon on sermon audio for those of you who weren't live and listened to it later on that should be pretty easy what was it anybody remember how to read the bible yeah and then what were the there were three <coughs> categories there remember that jake first thing was what the three a's come up with them Anybody? Analysis. Uh huh. Analysis and application. All right. Analysis, the same way that you preach. Uh, analysis, you start with analysis and then antithesis and then application. Analysis, meaning um, what? Kenneth. Saying. Yeah. Uh, what is the text saying? Um, how did I get? How did we get here? That kind of thing. Um, so you look at the text and you um, seek to see that in light of its context, which is perhaps the most important thing, but far more important than an understanding of the original languages. Uh, analysis, and then secondly, antithesis. What do we mean by that? Um, Gary, since you're rather new to the group, what do we mean by antithesis? By learning what the text does not mean. Exactly. Remember that sermon we preached on John 3.16. The first thing we say, well, I mean, this is a great example because of all the misunderstandings with regard to that verse. So if we start off with what it cannot mean, that clears up a lot of difficulties. Antithesis. Something cannot mean, a text cannot mean something and mean the exact opposite of that something at one and the same time. This is the logical principle of uh, the law of contradiction. So, and uh, John 3.16, what do we say it can't mean? Jimmy. That God died for everyone, or God loves every individual. Right, that God loves every, every single person in the world. And all we have to do to refute that is find one person that the scripture clearly says is not the object of God's love, which is pretty easy. You got Esau, you got Judas, you got Pharaoh. And so that's the principle of antithesis. And then the third point was 
analysis, antithesis, and application. And what do we mean by that? Ellen. Ellen, can you hear me? She's frozen. You hear? Can you hear me? Jake. Yep. What's the question, Winnie? You're getting chopped. Okay, ch chopping again. Um, you might want to. You might want to re restart it again. Close it and restart it. Um, I meant. Uh, what did I say? Uh, application. What do we mean by that? Simp right. Yeah, what, what is what is this? How does this relate to me? It, with without application, what are you? What's a perfect name for you without application? Gary, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Say that one more time, please. I said without application, what is a perfect name for us? Pharisees, right? Oh yes, yeah. Total hypocrites. If you're, if you, if, and so what do we do? We look at a text and we say, "Oh, how does this apply to me?" Abel, am I Abel? Uh, do I realize that my only hope is in the perfect sacrifice? Do I realize that this animal represents me? Um, that the wages of sin is death, etc. How about Ena? Do I walk with God? What does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean to walk with God through faith, etc.? So, that's what the... Uh, and, 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 yeah, I almost forgot one of the most important reasons I brought this up. And that is, how did I get that? Why did we talk about how to read the Bible from that particular text? Hebrews eleven twenty. Anybody come up with that? Kenneth. That, that's something that you probably, I mean, unless you were really paying attention, it probably it didn't uh, attach itself to your thinking at the time. Anybody think of it? Well, look at the text. It says, um, By faith, Isaac. And see, all the other people we've dealt with so far, it was rather easy to see um, the importance of faith in their life uh, and the imminent character of their faith. However, when we get to Isaac, what does it say? By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. See what I'm saying? So if you're not careful, you're in a heap of trouble. Uh, the questions you need to be asking are, what does it mean that he, uh, Isaac, Jake, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau? Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That kind of thing. And so, we need to, um, a, a, a very good illustration I've heard in the past about reading scripture, difficult passages, is it's sort of like uh, the hurdles in the track and field. It's very difficult to jump over the hurdle if you're standing right in front of it. So what do you have to do? You have to back up a few steps and then take a running start to get over there. You remind yourself of what you know. Once again, the antithesis helps greatly in that as well. So, back to uh, Galatians. Um, we... Uh, Luther says, by the way, we're on page 409, for those of you who have your commentary. Uh, Luther's commentary on Galatians is what we're using. Um, he says, with these offenses, this paragraph that begins like this on page 409, with these offenses, which the wicked allege, the godly are nothing moved. For they know that the devil hateth nothing more than the pure doctrine of the gospel. And therefore, he goeth about to deface it with innumerable offenses, that by this means he might root it out of men's hearts forever. Isn't that interesting? I mean, you with it, 
One of the most encouraging things about reading Luther, Calvin, Turretin, uh, these guys, Owen, is you come up on these statements that it's, it's sort of like, hey, well, I was thinking about that last night. The exact same idea. Notice this statement. For they know, he's talking about the godly, those who are regenerated. They know that the devil hateth nothing more than the pure doctrine of the gospel. Who but the reason? You see the importance of that? Who's talking about the pure doctrine of the gospel? As soon as we mention the importance of the pure doctrine of the gospel, what do our enemies say? Almost immediately. Jimmy. Uh, they accuse of perfect theology. Exactly. See? And what does that tell us about them? They're the same people that Luther was dealing with. The Apostle Paul was dealing with. We know that the devil hateth nothing more than the pure doctrine of the gospel. And therefore, that's only an attempt to destroy the pure doctrine of the gospel, right? You see that, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Because what are they saying when they say nobody has perfect doctrine? The bottom line would be doctrine is not the most important thing. You're not saved by truth. Right. Nobody has perfect doctrine, which is a ruse for denigrating doctrine. Now, uh, what per you've never heard, I've never heard, nobody that I know has ever heard anybody say, or even come close to saying, that anybody has perfect doctrine. You see that? So the only reason for the accusation is in order to denigrate doctrine. To say that doctrine really isn't all that important after all. In fact, perhaps the most influential reformed teacher in our age said that the object of faith is not doctrine but Christ. You see that. The same is the same exact kind of a statement. The pure doctrine of the gospel, and therefore he goeth about to deface it with innumerable offenses that by this means he might root it out of men's hearts forever. Um, this same guy said um, frequently, I think uh, Ellen commented on this, it says frequently acrostics do more harm than they do good. And what a, what a, he was speaking of a particular acrostic. And which one was he talking about? Ellen. Can you hear me? Tulip. Tulip. Now, and then he immediately said, in order to um, express what he meant by that, uh, the, he's was talking about the first point, total de because total depravity is a very misleading term. So once again, uh, we see exactly what Luther was seeing. They seek to root the gospel out of men's hearts forever. Um, and then in verse... Um, 17 of our text, they zealously affect you but not will. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. Um, they would exclude you. Did the Galatians know, the people that Paul was talking to, did they know that they were being excluded? Jacob, what, Jake, what would you say? Right, but okay. They no, that's the first thing. They did not know they were being excluded. It takes the apostle Paul to tell them that. Secondly, were they being excluded, Jake? Yeah, yeah they were. Yeah, and in once and in what sense were they being excluded? Well, they were being um, uh, urged to uh, uh, move back into the world of thinking the works mindset okay so but the, the point I'm trying to make is the, the, the Judaizers were excluding them uh, 
and excluding them from what? You see, the, the false teachers uh, are always, if you're, not, if you're a false teacher, you're, you're not a teacher of the gospel. You're a teacher of the false gospel. Therefore, uh, you, are, um, you are not motivated by, what is the true teacher motivated by primarily, um, Tom? Say that again, what? A teacher of the true gospel. What is his main motivation for teaching? Uh, the true gospel. <laughs> That's, that is his main motivation. Okay, for you, it's the glory of God. Yeah. So, um, to, and once you teach the false gospel, you have another motivation. This is, the, this is not complicated, lest any man should boast. What is the motivation of someone who's not preaching the true gospel, Kenneth? It? It's not five or six or seven or seven hundred. What is it? The glory of man. Exactly. Let's see, as Luther said in a different occasion, uh, the uh, theologian of the cross and the theologian of glory. And to tell me he wasn't. Tell me he was out of date. Wow, it's like yesterday he wrote that. Uh, theologian of the cross. And which carries with it the offense of the cross as opposed to the theologian of glory uh, seeking to attract people unto themselves which would exclude them. Exclude them from um, communion with God. He continues, Before when nothing else was taught in the church but man's traditions, the devil did not so rage. For whilst the strong man kept the house, all that he possessed was in peace. But now when a stronger cometh, which vanquisheth and bindeth that strong one and spoileth his house, then he begins to rage indeed. Luke eleven twenty one. And this is an infallible token that the gospel which we profess is of God. So what's he saying? He says, I know for sure that what I'm preaching is of God. How come, Gary? Say it one more time, yeah. please. He says, this is an infallible token that the doctrine which we profess is of God. Token meaning proof. What was the proof that he said is he's, he's completely confident that what he pre preached was of God because of what? Did you get it? I guess I didn't. He, uh, Kenneth, what was it? There's, there's no room to boast. Yes, but in this particular kind, let me read that again. Uh, he says, when nothing else was taught in the church but man's traditions. He's speaking of Rome. We're, you see, we're dealing with a different enemy. And he was, but it's the same enemy with different garb. Uh, the devil did not so rage, for whilst the strong man kept the house, all that he possessed was in peace. But now when a stronger cometh, which vanquisheth and bindeth that strong one and spoileth his house, then he beginneth to rage indeed. And this is an infallible token that the doctrine which we profess is of God. See, because it brings about the rage of the enemy, a tumult around us. For else, as it is said in Job 40, that behemoth, would lie hid under the trees in the cupboard of the reed and fence. But now that he rangeth about like a roaring lion and stirreth up such hurly-burlies, it is a manifest token that he feeleth the power of our preaching. So we can be encouraged by the fact of what? Jimmy. The opposition you feel. Yeah. A lot of opposition. You we were talking yesterday. This, this, this. Uh, these people who are denying the doctrine of the Trinity. When Paul said they are jealous over you, but amiss, he showeth by the way who are the authors of sects, to wit those jealous spirits which in all times overflow, overthrow the true doctrine, and trouble the public peace. For these being stirred up with a perverse zeal, imagine that they have a certain singular holiness, modesty, patience, and doctrine above others. 
And therefore they think that they are able to provide for the salvation of all men. That they can teach more profound and profitable things, ordain better service and ceremonies than all other teachers besides, whom they despise as nothing in comparison of themselves, and abase their authority and corrupt these, those things which they have purely taught. The false apostles had such a wicked and perverse zeal, stirring up sects, not only in Galatia, but also in all the places wheresoever Paul and the other apostles had preached. Um, so this is, this is interesting because, well, we'll get to it in a few seconds. So I think I'll just keep going. Uh, there are very many at this day in Germany which are possessed with the kind of jealousy which pretend great religion, modesty, doctrine, patience, etc. And yet in very deed they are ravening wolves who with their hypocrisy seek nothing else but to discredit us that the people might esteem and reverence them only and receive no other doctrine but theirs. And then down into the next heading, uh, on verse 18 he says, he's quoting verse 18 in the next heading, but it is a good thing to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. As if he should say, I commend you for this, that you were so zealous for me and loved me so entirely when I preached the gospel amongst you in the infirmity of the flesh, you ought, to bear the shame, you ought to bear the same affection towards me now when I'm absent, even as if I had never departed from you. For although I be absent in the body, yet have ye my doctrine, which ye ought to retain and maintain, seeing ye receive the Holy Ghost through it. There's so much for immediate regeneration. Ye receive the Holy Ghost through the doctrine thinking with yourselves that Paul is always present with you as long as ye have this doctrine. I do not therefore reprehend your zeal, but I praise it, and so far forth uh, I praise it as it is the zeal of God or of the Spirit and not of the flesh. Now the zeal of the Spirit is always good, for it is an earnest affection and motion of the heart to a good thing, and so is not the zeal of the So what he's talking about. Uh, this is an important topic that you don't hear very much about, and that is true zeal as opposed to, opposed to false zeal. Um, and so what can we say about zeal per se? Jake? So, when we consider the phenomenon of zeal, uh, just because since there is a false zeal as well as a true zeal, that should put us um, on, uh, on guard, as it were. How so, Tom? Um, because false zeal, well, it's false, I mean, it, 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 it's, and false zeal is, is hidden the the truth of of man's boasting and and preaching not the glory of God. Yeah, well, yeah. It, when you to be forewarned, as they say, is to be forearmed. Once you know that there is a false zeal as well as a true zeal, then you're on your on guard <clears throat> because <clears throat> zeal per se is neither good nor bad. See, since there's a false zeal. So, um, as Paul says in uh, Romans 12, excuse me, Romans 10, my heart's desire and bear, prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I mean, what could be clearer than that? He says, these people are very zealous. But before he tells us about their zeal, he says that they're not saved. My heart's desire and, prayer, desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, which means they're not saved. 
for they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And so, that's the main ingredient of true zeal. What is that? Kenneth? I'm sorry? The main ingredient, the, ma the, the main indicator uh, by which we can distinguish true zeal from false zeal is what? versus the glory of man. Yeah. Uh, whether, the, whether the zeal comes out of uh, knowledge. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So if a, if a person's zeal is according to knowledge, then what? Helen. Can you hear me? He's still... I'm still breaking up on her end. If it is according to knowledge, then what, Jimmy? Then it is a zeal which God approves of. It's a good zeal. Right. Because, because where does the knowledge come from? We're not talking about mathematics. What kind of knowledge are we talking about, Jimmy? Knowledge of the truth. Knowledge exactly. Of the knowledge of the gospel. And that word, epignosco, knowledge, the word for knowledge... In Romans 10.2 means a precise knowledge. So um, a person is not a Christian unless he, once again, we're not talking about perfect. Nobody's got perfect now. We don't take, we don't come within a million miles of saying that anybody has perfect anything, much less knowledge of the gospel. But it is a precise knowledge. Paul said, I know who I am, I have believed and am persuaded. Uh, he knows, we know, we know what the gospel is, we're able to distinguish it from the false gospel. And so our zeal is a zeal which is according to knowledge and is a true zeal. And so, what's kind of interesting um, is that these people, <laughs> it's got, it kind of a, a it's, it's, it's an irony and that is that these people who rail against the, or are so disturbed about uh, cage stage Calvinists, they're very zealous about cage stage Calvinists, aren't they? <laughs> Gary, you got that? Yes. yes. What, what am I saying? <clears throat> well, you're from the perspective of, uh, uh, from kind of accusing them of being in a cage stage. Right. And they insist that there are such a th there is such a thing as a cage stage Calvinist. They get bent out of shape about their being there. They're very zealous. You see that? It's, it's ironic. Uh, but what, what is a cage stage Calvinist? What's the definition? What do they mean when they say refer to a person as a cage stage Calvinist? Well, it's from my understanding, it's it's someone that has received the some or or the knowledge of the truth and. Um, Kind of go a little, I don't know, uh, <laughs> they get a little crazy about to, it, I guess. Yeah, well, to us, uh, the designation cage stage Calvinist is a, is a compliment. And because uh, it, when you consider who are the people that call other people cage stage Calvinists, they're the, they're the Calvinists of our day, Calvinist leaders of our day. When a person who's raised in Arminianism as I was, and he hears the gospel of grace for the first time, and he's been given an understanding of it. There's no way he's not going to be excited about it. Uh, and he begins to see uh, things more and more and more clearly. He begins to come against not only false doctrine, but the teachers of false doctrine. Then, they're, they're, then you've got too much. That's over the top. See, they can't stand that. Uh, so the importance of true zeal as opposed to false zeal. Let's go now to uh, our catechism study. And we are on question. Uh, I know the question we're on. I'm not sure if I remember the number of it. I think it's 35. Uh, anyway. 
What is adoption? Last week we dealt with um, justification. Let me get to the place where we are in my... Uh, Okay, uh, last week we dealt with justification, That's, well, that was 33, now we're on 34. What is adoption? Now, to put this in a broader perspective, we are dealing with the, do which, which person of the Trinity are we dealing with? Um, Jake, you remember? I don't think you were, were you here last week? Yeah, that's what we're dealing with right now, the application. So, by way of review, we go back to question 20. Uh, did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? God having. How does mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life? Did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by Redeemer? That's the work of the Father. Did God leave all mankind to perish in it? No. He elected some to everlasting life. The election of the Father, then beginning in question 21, now we're dealing with uh, the salvation of those by a Redeemer. Now we're dealing with God the Son, and all the way up to question, uh, we went over prophet, priest, and king. And then all the way up to question number, um, what was it? I think 28 was the last question with regard to the son. Uh, and then question 29, how are we made partakers of the redemption uh, purchased by Christ? And the answer, we're made partakers of the redemption purchased by the effectual application of it to us by His Holy Spirit. So, Briefly stated, uh, salvation is of the Father, by the Son, and through the Spirit. What is the work of God the Father in salvation? Jimmy. Election. Election. Question 20. What's the work of God the Son? Questions 21 through 28. Um, Tom. Uh, he procures it. Exactly. The Father determines it, ordains it, and the Son comes and procures the salvation that the Father has determined for His people. And then the Holy Spirit comes and does what? Kenneth? Applies it. Applies it. How does the Spirit apply to us? The Spirit applies to us through redemption verses by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. That's a pretty in-your-face statement, right? Working faith in us. Why are they so clear about that? Gary, what do you think? Working faith in us is, is, is that is the work man, that, the, that the Holy Spirit does. It, it works faith that, that we depend and, and rely entirely upon God. Well, what's the major? What's one of the major errors in the false gospel, in all of its expressions? Uh, what is that, Kenneth? What am I thinking about? That God accepts you because of your faith. Exactly. And so, if this faith, if, if this faith is worked in you, which means you didn't have it before it was worked in you, then you cannot take credit. And say that God accepts you on the basis of something that you do because it was worked in you. That's the importance of that. Uh, Spirit applies to us to redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. What is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit. Whereby? Tom, effectual calling. Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit whereby convincing us Ah, convincing us of our sin and misery. He, uh, enlightening. Uh, oh, light, lightning, 
Wait, what? I forget. Hold on. Convincing uh, us of our sin and misery, enlightening uh, our minds. Yeah, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, um, renewing our wills, and... He does something. persuade and, and enable. Persuade. Yeah, and, per and persuading and enable us uh, to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. What benefits? Now we get what benefits that they are effectually called, but they can in this life. They that are effectually called doing this life partake of justification, adoption, and sanctification. So we're still, don't get it out of your minds, we're still dealing with primarily, of course, just as in all five points of the gospel, you can't deal with any one of the points without dealing with all the rest of them. And so it is with the three persons of the Trinity. As we said, which is, I mean, have you guys meditated on this? Is, this is one of the most marvelous things, and that is that um, Christ in his execution of the office of prophet, uh, in the office of priest, and the office of king, um, primarily in his office of prophet, and I thought back of, let's look at this, this since this is Christmas time, <laughs> I, thought, I thought back at... Uh, uh, Isaiah 9, 6. That's a pretty good December verse, right? For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And think about that. that. That kind of throws us for a loop, doesn't it? Uh, wonderful. Counselor. Wonderful. There's no problem with that. Counselor. He counsels us through his spirit. The mighty God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But then we get to the everlasting Father. So, but I think that helps us when we meditate on the fact that Christ executes the office of a prophet. Because that office deals primarily with the Father. How does Christ execute the office of a prophet? In revealing to us, by His Word and Spirit, the will of God for our salvation. You see how that deals primarily with the, with the work of the Father? Um... We've offended the Father and revealing to us by His Word, which is to say the law and Spirit, the will of God, the Father for our salvation. And then, of course, the office of a priest is primarily dealing with the work of the Son. And then the office of a king is primarily the work of the Spirit. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so wonderful. So... Um, of, uh, ju uh, justification, adoption, and sanctification. And last week, we dealt with justification. And what is justification? Ellen, you got that one down? Can you hear me? I think she's still frozen. Jimmy, have you got that one memorized? <laughs> Justification. Justification is an act of God's free grace when He pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in His sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith. Alone. Justification is an act, that's an important word, of God's free grace wherein He pardoneth all our sins and accepts us as righteous in His sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed us and received by faith alone. We frequently um, distinguish justification from sanctification, right? Jake, you know where we're going with that. Justification, it says, justification is an act of God's free grace. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. That's no accident that they use different words. Tell us what they're talking about there. Justification is a, uh, a one-time uh, deal. It's a punctiliar 
uh, event, and uh, sanctification is an ongoing process. Right, exactly. Justification is an objective declaration. Apart from anything subjective in you, you've got to nail that down, all of us, right? Uh, because the devil's, if you don't nail that down, the devil's going to, he's, hey, he's like, a, like a swarm of, of, of hornets around your head. Uh, you have to have that nailed down. Justification relates to no subjective condition in you whatsoever. And so the devil will come to you and say what? What am I talking to you? You know what I'm talking about, Gary? Huh? You know what, what I'm referring to? Say it again, please. I say that justification is an objective declaration which has nothing whatsoever to do with your subjective condition. Follow me? Yes. If you don't have that nailed down, what's the devil going to do? He's going to come to you and say what? He does it anyway. Yeah, he's going to convince me that I have something to do with my justification. Right. And, and you're not a Christian because look at what you just did. You got it? Right. And as soon as you say yes, then you, hey, you're falling from grace in your thinking. Galatians 5, 4 doesn't mean you're, you're saved at breakfast and lost at lunch. It means you've, fallen, you've tripped over and fallen back into work thinking again. No, when the devil comes to you and says, you can't be a Christian because of what you just did, whatever it is. You're not a Christian because of anything that you do. Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed us and received by faith alone. You're saved owing to the fact that the Holy Spirit has worked faith in you, which faith unites you to the righteousness of Christ. So, justification is an objective declaration. It has nothing whatsoever to do with your performance. Uh, and uh, secondly, as Jake just said, it's punctiliar, meaning what, Kenneth? It occurs at a point in time. Exactly. So the Apostle Paul was no more justified the day that he died than he was when he got knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus. See that? It is punctiliar. It occurs. It, it is a one-time um, event. Whereas, once again, in, con in contrasting it with sanctification... Tom, is that true of sanctification? It's a one-time event? No. No, sanctification is a what? It's an ongoing process. Right, it's a process. Uh, we call it progressive. It's a, a process involving progress. That's why uh, 2, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith. Walking presupposes what? Jake. Huh? It presupposes life. It, uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's the most important. Uh, and it presupposes progress, right? Unless a guy's chasing his tail, walking around in circles. It presupposes a person, you see somebody walking, you think they're, you're headed somewhere. In fact, we frequently say, where are you headed? It presupposes uh, progress. So sanctification is not a is not punctilious, it's not a one time act, it is a process of progress. Justification, however, is a declaration, it's objective. And what do we mean by that? We can't take any of these things for granted. Jimmy, what do we mean when, you, when we say justification is objective? Justification, we are. <clears throat> More like we are conscious, it's a declaration, it has nothing to do with our doing. And right. scientifically, while it is monotistic, we are conscious of our progressing, our, our doing something. Yeah. It is a statement, it is objective, meaning it has nothing to do with your subjective, as we were just talking about. Condition. It's a declaration that you are righteous before God. And the only way you can be righteous before God is what, Gary? Your 
The only way that I can be righteous before God is by Christ. Right. It's, it's, it's by being perfect. Matthew 5.45 Be ye therefore perfect. Or 5.48 Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's not just a suggestion. Uh, to stand before an infinitely holy God, we must be perfect. And therefore, that means that justification has to be a righteousness, not our own. For we do not have this side of glory. We do not have perfection. So, uh, exactly if where any pardoneth all our sin, accepts us as righteous in his sight. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed us and received. And what else did we say? We said that it involves two things. Did you notice that? Justification is an act of God's free, wherein he, first of all, pardoneth all our sins. All right? That's, these are two parts. And accepts us as righteous in his sight. Those two, two different things. Pardoneth all our sins means what, Kenneth? Sorry, it means that we are what? Yeah, I say it, it includes two things. For God to justify us. Yes. A man has two problems that have to be solved before he can be accepted in the sight of God. And what are those? He pardons our sins and he also imputes the wrong exactly. sins to us. Man's two problems. In the words of the uh, Church of England prayer book, we have done those things which we ought not to have done. Secondly, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done and there is no health in us. And so... Uh, the first problem was dealt with by the cross. Christ paid the penalty. We've done those things which you ought not to have done. We've gone over the hedge, as the Puritans used to say. Uh, and so Christ paid for those um, transgressions and then the you know, sins of commission, as they used to say. Some of the Baptist theology is, is correct. Sins of commission and sins of omission. See that? Transgressions and um, omissions. Sins of commission, sins of omission. He, uh, he pardoneth all our sins through the cross and accepts us as righteous in his sight. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith. And what do we say? What's the, diff the similarity between the true gospel and the false gospel? Tom, the similarity. Uh, the similarity is that both say that you have to uh, have faith in Christ. Exactly, for salvation. And what's the difference? Uh, the difference is how that faith is applied, I guess. Well, the relationship, yeah, the relationship between faith and salvation. What does the false gospel say, Gary? What does the false gospel say the relationship between faith and salvation is? The false gospel says that, that I'm saved by my faith. Be, because of. Because by, of. Is a, by is an accurate. Yeah, because of God accepts you on the basis of something that you do. Namely, believing in Jesus. Why is it that God cannot accept you on the basis of believing in Jesus? Gary. Not only does he not, he cannot. We say with reverence. And what is that? Why he cannot accept me? Because of your faith. Because my faith, or I'm, I'm, I'm putting, I'm making faith my God, so to speak. All right, yeah, that, that's a different that's angle. It. He cannot accept you because of you, because your faith is tainted with sin, like everything else that you do. You got it? So, um, and he can only accept perfect righteousness. So he cannot accept you. And that's what John Wesley said. God accepts our faith instead of perfect righteousness. That's exactly what I was taught. Though nobody was smart enough to teach it that clearly. When I was a kid. He accepts your faith. He, God plays a head game. He, he knows that your faith isn't perfect righteousness. But he pretends like it is and accepts you on that basis. That's Southern Baptist theology right there in a nutshell. Uh, that's the false gospel. Uh, and so, what's the relationship between faith and salvation in the true gospel? Jake? It's, uh, it, it's, it's necessary, but it's not the, it's not the immediate grounds of your, of your uh, pardon. 
Oh, okay, but you still have, what is the relationship between faith and salvation? Well, the, it's instrumental. Right. Faith, Through faith, faith. Yes, like a water pipe. Right. Through faith, what happens? Benefits of Christ uh, come to us. Right. Through faith, Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to you. That's the see that the importance of that word relationship. Relate both hold to the necessity of faith. The relationship of faith to salvation. The false gospel says God accepts you on the basis of your faith. Because I believe God accepts me. Try you name one person that believes in the false gospel that doesn't hold to that. Guaranteed. That's why they never talk about imputation. Never. I asked the associate pastor of the church we were going to about Adrian Rogers, which I was born and uh, raised in the Southern Baptist Convention. He was a president for two terms. I don't know of anybody else who was two term president. I said, how come this guy never, this guy never even mentions imputation his entire ministry? Oh, uh, inconsistency, inconsistency, inconsistency. That's insanity is what that is, not inconsistency. Huh? Something as important as, an imp as imputation, you have no hope without the imputed righteousness of Christ. So, um, and then we get today, we get to adoption. Um, and so what's the question? What is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace whereby we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. All right, so first question. Is adoption similar to... So we got justification, adoption, and sanctification. Is adoption more similar to sanctification or justification? It's kind of a trick question, really, but uh, I'm kind of curious as to what you... Jimmy? It's a justification. It's right. an act. It is not a process. Exactly. So God adopts you uh, as a one-time act, just as with justification. Adoption is an act of God's whereby we are received into the number. We have a right to, the, to all the privileges of the sons of God. It, it was really interesting. Well, I was just reading, was it this morning? I think it was this morning even. The genealogy in the first chapter of Luke. If you ever noticed, uh, he goes through the... Uh, he starts with, is it the first chapter? Uh, where am I? Huh? Where is the genealogy? My eyes are killing me. Um, somebody find it. Oh, it's Luke 3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Luke 3, beginning with, look, he starts, uh, verse 23, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And he goes right here, was the son of Matthew, Levi, Melchi, and on and on and on and on and on. And on. You get to the verse, 20, uh, verse 37, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of... Malaleel, which was the son of Can Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Now, Adam was not only the son of God in the sense that he was created by God, like Thomas Edison is the father of the light bulb because he created or he invented it. But this was a filial relationship. Right? He walked with God. So he was the son of God in a much more important sense than just mere creation. Uh, and so what happened um, was that he lost this filial relationship, father-son relationship with the father. And so that has to be restored. And it is restored in the act of adoption. So Adam was number one he was as he was created he was a citizen in the kingdom of god 
And he was also a son in the family of God. Um, and uh, John 1.12, we think of that, do we not? But as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority, um, authorization to become the sons of God. Um, now, so what immediately comes to your mind? If if you receive as many as received him to them they gave you power. Okay, were they the sons of God before they received him or after they received him? Tom. Wait, say that again. What? <laughs> John one twelve. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Were they the sons of God before they received him or after they received him? After. After. Which means they had lost their sonship. We lost our sonship in Adam. We forfeited it. And whose sons were we? Helen, can you hear me? Whose sons, whose sons were we before we received him? Is that what you said? Yeah, okay. I'm, I, I guess I'm still breaking up. So, uh, uh, Jay... Uh, Jay the sons of the devil. Exactly. You are of your, John 8, 44. You are your, of your father's the devil. He wasn't just saying bad words. This was a fact. Unmitigated. You are of your father's the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar. And the father of it. So... We lost our sonship um, and were transferred from a, a, a high, uh, Earth Sinus says that himself, right? We lost the image of God and were transferred into the transmitted or tra what's the word I'm looking for? Transformed into the image, the hateful image of Satan. Try to find one body, a person that, that agrees to that. That the fallen man took on the image of Satan. It's the truth. So, uh, Adam was a citizen in the kingdom of God, which he lost and uh, became a, a servant of the devil. He serves the devil. Uh, secondly, he was a son in the family of God and he became a son of the devil. Hey, but, total, but to keep in mind, total depravity doesn't mean the sinner is as bad as he can be. <laughs> I mean, what's, what's any more ridiculous? So, before, at, before we became sons of God, uh, what was our relationship to God? Tom, before we became the son of God. Mm -hmm. um, our relationship to God was... Uh, something judge and uh, okay that's the, that's the the kingdom before we became uh, okay yeah, we could put it this way right before we became sons our relationship to God was judge to criminal now our relationship to God is son to father right as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God and once again, this is related to what we were saying about 15 minutes ago. Uh, once you become the son of God, you never go back into that uh, relationship of judge to criminal. Now, with respect to being a citizen, we were just talking about a citizen in the kingdom. Now, with respect to the judge, we are those... Because God never ceases to be a judge. We are those who have been acquitted. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So, uh, with respect to God as judge, we are those who have been acquitted. With respect to God as father, we have been transferred from being the sons of the devil now to the sons of God. 
So you see um, how wonderful this doctrine is. Justification, adoption, and sanctification. Um, so we just said adoption like justification is objective, uh, whereas sanctification and what else is subjective along with sanctification? which really can be separated from it. Jake? Um, well, I mean, would it be um, positional glorification? Oh, okay, yeah, that, that, that's the final. I'm going on the other end, uh, which is uh, regeneration, right? Regener right. You, you, which you can't separate from sanctification. The difference between regeneration and sanctification is... is uh, Something akin to the, the difference between starting off in your car on a journey and, and, and being in the middle of it. Uh, so regeneration is subjective. Sanctification is subjective. Adoption is what? Jimmy? Adoption is objective. Justification is objective. Regeneration is subjective. Uh, sanctification, subjective. Uh, look at uh, Galatians four, which we didn't, we weren't there too long ago in our study of Galatians, verses four through six. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. All right. So, uh, next, we want to look at, uh, we don't have too much time, but we look at the relationship of adoption to faith. And what is that? Kenneth. Look back, look back at John 1, 12. Huh? Kenneth, you see it? Is he frozen okay. too? Uh, I have the verse. John 1, 12, read it. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay, okay, you got it? You see that right at the end? But as many as received him, to them gave he power or authority or authorization to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so the relationship... Uh, and, and by the way, as an aside, because this is so often... Misunderstood. Um, you do you? Well, they put it in the form of a question. Do you receive him in so far as you believe on his name, or do you believe on his name in so far as you receive him? Does that make sense? Are you considered to have received him because you believe on his name, or you can, or are you considered to have believed on his name because you receive him? You see the huge difference in those two. It's another expression of the true gospel as opposed to the false. Gary, what is it? I believe on his name because I have received him. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me state the... It's, it's, it's not that simple to think. It's, well, it's simple, but in the expression of it, it sounds complicated. It can't be too complicated because I'm a simple person. <laughs> uh, but the Chinese is much clearer. This is the way a Chinese states it. Uh, but as many as received him. Which is to say those who believed on his name. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. You see how clear it is in the Chinese? It separates it in English. See, But as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe. See, but you can take that and put that at the end. But as many as received him. Which is to say. Those who believe on his name, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So put it in another way. Does that verse 
answer the question, how do you know you've received him? Or does it answer the question, how do you know you believed on his name? Kenneth, you got it? <laughs> Let me say it again. Does it answer the question, how do you know you've received him? Or does it answer the question, how do you know you believed on his name? Does it say, you know you believed on his name if you've received him? Or does it say, you know you've received him because you believed on his name? Which one is it? Right. Exactly. You see how important that is. This is the difference between the true gospel and the false gospel. In fact, I was attending a church um, in Taiwan where the pastor got up and announced... We are happy to announce that uh, the president of China Evangelical Seminary will be preaching today. And guess what his text was, John 1, 12. And this is what he said. He said, you might have been attending this church for 25 or 30 years, but I want to ask you today, have you received Jesus? You may be an elder in the church. You may be a deacon in the church. But I want to ask you, have you received Jesus? He said, now, believing on his name, we're not going to talk about that. That's too abstract. You see it? So in other words, what was he saying? You know you have believed on his name because you received him. But what's the next question to ask? Jake. Um, the, uh... <laughs> How do you know you've received him? Yeah, yeah. Give me a J, give me an E, give me an S, give me a U, give me a, what do you got? Jesus, say it again, Jesus, louder. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's my background. You know you've received him if you believed on his name, which is to say who he is, what he came to do. So, the relationship of adoption to faith, according to John 1, 12, is we are adopted. Not only are we justified through faith, we are adopted through faith. Okay, next question. What's the relationship of adoption to um, regeneration? What would you say? Kenneth. This is a more an, a, a subjective thing. Let me give you a hint, 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 because regeneration is subjective. So the relationship yeah. of adoption to regeneration. You, you under, uh, uh, as a result of your regeneration, you understand. That you exactly. And, and listen to verse 6 of Galatians 4 again. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, Crying, Abba, Father. The relationship of regeneration to adoption is that he gives you the spirit of a son, right? Uh, he causes you to love. Uh, he gives you a filial love for the Father. We'll have to continue this next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another time together for this wonderful doctrine of adoption. Behold, now are we the sons of God. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.